Welcome to the Cyber Rants Podcast, where we're all about sharing the forbidden secrets and slightly embellished truths about corporate cybersecurity programs. We're ranting, we're raving, and we're telling you the stuff that nobody talks about on their fancy website and trade show giveaways, all to protect you from cybersecurity criminals. And now, here's your hosts, Mike Rotondo, Zach Fuller, and Laura Chavez. Hello and welcome to the Cyber Rants podcast. This is your co-host Zach Fuller, joined by Mike Rotondo and Laura Chavez, and we have a show for you today, all about SOC 2 audits. It's a topic that comes up a lot, so we're going to take a little bit of a dive to help you understand the world of the SOC 2 audits, which are becoming very, very prevalent. Before we do, Mike, you want to kick us off with the news? Hey, good afternoon. Welcome to the podcast. Here are the headlines for 430-2021. Ransomware gang now warns they will leak new Apple logos, iPad, and plans. The R Evil ransomware gang has mysteriously removed Apple schematics from their data leak site after privately warning Quanta, which is the company in Taiwan that builds these devices, that they would leak drawings for the new iPad and new Apple logos if they had not paid by 5-1. Bleeping Computer, who has this web has this story, has since seen a private chat created between R Evil and Quanta four days ago, where R Evil told Quanta that they hid the data leak page and will stop talking to reporters to allow negotiations to continue. So that's interesting. You think um, it's a you think it's an Apple still, or do you think they changed it? I don't know, and I just wonder if they're you know is it worth buying an Apple going forward if you get a bunch of hackers that have your schematics? So good point. Good point. It's yeah. probably not a pair or an orange. <laughs> I'm yeah. guessing, in a logo. Oh, yeah, who knows? Apple patches Mac OS zero day exploited by malware for months. CVE 2021-30657. Uh, it was, this is a zero day that's been exploited by Schleyer malware for months and has finally introduced, enabled the app tracking transparency feature and policy in iOS, iPad OS, and TV OS. It's a logic issue that allowed attackers to craft a Mac OS payload that is not checked by Gatekeeper, the Mac OS security feature. So, patch, patch, patch. Uh, Emotet malware nukes itself today from all infected computers worldwide. This is dated 425. Um, Emotet is being uninstalled on 425 from all infected devices with the help of a malware module delivered in January by law enforcement, primarily the Germans, it looked like. Uh, The botnet's takedown is the result of an international law enforcement action that allowed investigators to take control of the Emotet servers and disrupt the malware (laughs) operation. After the takedown operation, law enforcement pushed a new configuration of active to active Emotet infections so that the malware begin to use the command and control service controlled by, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name of this organization, Germany's Federal Police Agency. <laughs> law enforcement then distributed a new Emotet module in the form of a 32-bit Emotet loader.dll to all infected systems that will automatically uninstall it. So they're sending out like notifications for the uninstall. You know, that's the question I have. Are they doing like the FBI did with the exchange servers and just uninstalling it, the web shells and not telling you this is an unprecedented, you know, as far as intrusion on uh, privacy, I think. So speaking of the FBI, they just shared 4 million email addresses used by Emotet that have been pawned. So millions of email addresses collected by the Emotet botnet for malware distribution campaigns have been shared by the FBI as part of the agency's effort to clean infected computers. Um, given the sensitive nature of this data, the Emotet data is not publicly searchable. Subscribers of the service that were impacted by the Emotet breach have been already been alerted. Um, this is an interesting story. For all those out there that are saying, well, when we get hit with ransomware, we're just going to pay. Only 8% of businesses that paid a ransom got all of their data back. Whoa, you really thought they were going to give you your data back? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What, you can't trust criminals these days? What? what? I can't a believe it. Nuts. Who knew? Those that are answering your data to, to, to finance terrorism cannot be trusted, apparently. Yeah, the average total cost to recovery from a ransomware attack has more than doubled in a year, increasing from 761000 in 2020 to $1.85 million in 2021. According to Sophos, the average ransom paid is 170 grand. Global findings also show that only 8% of organizations managed to get back all of their data after paying ransom, with 29% getting back no more than half. The survey polled 5,400 IT decision makers in mid-sized organizations in 30 countries. So, so, 
some of the uh, crypto ransomware, the the driver virus, right, that locks everything. It'll do a separate hash key for every file, and so what are they gonna? Oh, wow. They give you like a database of like seventy million. <laughs> Nick Ash is like, here you go. Have fun trying to figure this ball of yarn out. Where's the customer service these days? I know. It's like the last one I had a little chat window. It's like chat with me now to pay ransom. I'm like, oh, this is cool. This service, good service, service good. I, I just remember working with a CISO one time. And he's like, all right, let's just go pay the ransom. And we were like, no, <laughs> we're not going to give out $2 million <laughs> in Bitcoin. Thank you. We can just track the Bitcoins, you know? Yeah, exactly, because they won't be converted to anything. Cloud misconfiguration, a major risk for cloud security. Misconfigured cloud-based databases continue to cause data breaches. Big surprise. Millions of database servers are currently exposed across cloud providers. New State of Cloud Security 2020 report reveals that misconfigured cloud-based databases continue to pose a severe security risk to organizations. This has gotten worse since COVID-19. The pandemic is exacerbating the situation. The transition to cloud infrastructure has created new security vulnerabilities. 84% of companies surveyed are concerned they've been compromised and don't know it, while 28% have already been already been, been hacked and are aware of the attack. So, yeah, go cloud. Um, attacks targeting ADFS, ADFS token signing certificates could become the next big threat. So conventional access control and detection mechanisms alone are no longer sufficient to protect the enterprise. Uh, ADFS services, Active Directory Federation services, uh, environments are, are, get, are becoming targeted. Um, threat actors have begun focusing on ADFS as an avenue to gain and maintain long-term access on Microsoft 365 and other cloud-based service environments is according to FireEye. For those of you who have NAS's QNAP NAS devices under ransomware attack, so Back them up. QNAP NAS device owners are once again under attack by ransomware operators who are exploiting a recently fixed vulnerability to lock data on vulnerable devices by using the 7-zip open source file archiver ut utility. That's CVE 2020-2509. This is a command injection vulnerability in QTS and QUTS Hero. And then there's CVE 2020-36195, which is a SQL injection. This is an interesting one. Hacker dumped sensitive household records of 250 million Americans. Now, we just did the census. We have something like 330 million Americans. So if you're of the lucky 80 million that still have your records intact, then good for you. On April 22nd, 2021, a hacker going by the online handle of Pom Pom Purin leaked a database containing personal and sensitive household data of over 250 million American citizens and residents. Uh, this was seen by hackread.com. Oh, wait, wait, that's, that's, that's the, you're telling me he named himself after the cute little golden retriever that's like a Japanese cartoon thing? That's just terrible. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, you gotta give him A's for cre creativity, right? I mean. Well, I mean, not really. He ripped off an animation thing that he was probably watching. That's so. true. But, you know, you're sitting there writing code. You gotta have something to do, right? <laughs> Watch some Jan Japanese anime. Uh, yeah, I. I I don't know. Well, anyway, anyway, the, the database is leaked on a prominent hacker forum and compromised 263 gigabytes worth of records. Uh, a bunch of CZ, CSV files with 200,000 listings. It, although it's unclear who collected or owned the data, according to the sources, the leak came from Open Apache Solar SOLR hosted on Amazon Web Server. So if you're on AWS, you, keep in mind, you're not bulletproof, all right? Um, you do have to secure that. Middle market companies facing a record number of data breaches. That's good news, right? Middle market companies possess a significant amount of valuable data, but continue to lack appropriate levels of protective controls and staffing. The, the results revealed that 28% of middle market leaders claim that their company experienced data breaches in the last year, a sharp rise from 18%. 33% of middle market executives said they experienced a ransomware attack or demand in 2020. 45% of social engineering attacks were successful last year, a spike from 28% the previous year. Large middle market companies, 67% reporting the manipulation attempted of workers and 43% re reporting ransomware attacks compared to 19 and 24% small organizations. The middle market is responding, hopefully this is positive news, by increasing its investment in a variety of protective measures, and I'm assuming it's gonna be tools and maybe additional staff with 71% of respondents having dedicated a function focused on data security and privacy. Um, if you want to spend that money, just contact Zach at silentsector.com. So uh, with that, Laurel, how about some vulnerabilities? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm, you know, 
on Palm Pyramid, man. I, you know, whatever. Anyway, so not a lot this year. There's not any. Um, there's not any validated POCs for exploits this week, which is good. However, I've, you know, we talked about content management for websites. There's a lot more content management exploits being thrown up for validation. Um, some for Kirby CMS. Uh, what I wanted to bring up specifically was for WordPress plugin. Anyways, it's GraphQL, uh, which is a framework for APIs. So I, I think that's interesting. Um, and that's a denial of service for that. And there's also a remote code execution enabled for that as well. So um, make sure you maintain your WordPress stuff. Okay, stop using plugins. Or stop using WordPress. Yeah, just stop using WordPress. I, you know, I don't want to talk about WordPress like that. I mean, I, you know, it's it's like a dirty rag. You know what I mean? It's not like, it's like you can't use it. You just got to be very careful how you use it because you, know, you might dirty something that you want clean. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, you don't clean... You don't clean your windshield with a dirty rag sort of thing. So anyways, use it at your discretion. <laughs> <laughs> I've had many, many WordPress sites throughout the years and probably won't do that again. Um, but uh, onward to SOC 2 audits. This is a topic that is very prevalent. It's something that people need to be thinking about if they're, especially if they're in the business to business technology space. So if you're a, Software as a service provider, a system integrator of some kind that has, you know, any type of proprietary systems or data handling that you're providing and using for services for larger enterprises, SOC 2 is going to come into effect. So ed tech, med tech, fintech, all the techs, uh, this is something that's being uh, demanded more and more by uh, organizations of all size and SOC 2 has quickly become the the, the US standard, I would say, for a third party attestation of security. And so it's, you know, it, it, and I think there, there are a lot of great things in the SOC 2 requirements. Um, there are a tremendous amount of benefits and companies are using it or learning that they can use it as an asset, which is great. But uh, there's also a little bit of a misconception that, well, if everybody's doing it, it must be easy, right? And, and I think that's not the case. We'll talk about through this episode, how to prepare, what you need to think about, uh, the different types of audits, and so on. But before we get into that, want even more Cyber Rants? Be sure to subscribe to the Cyber Rants podcast. Get your copy of our best selling book, Cyber Rants, on Amazon today. This podcast is brought to you by Silent Sector, the firm dedicated to building world class cybersecurity programs for mid market and emerging companies across the U.S. Silent Sector also provides industry leading penetration tests and cyber risk assessments. Visit silentsector.com and contact us today. Mike, handing it over to you, being that you do SOC 2 audits as an auditor, and, and then on the other side, help other companies get prepared for SOC 2 audits, what are your, what are you seeing out there as kind of the biggest stumbling blocks or maybe misconceptions that you want people to know right off the bat about SOC 2? Well, the number one misconception that I see is that people think it's an IT audit. While it is, IT is a huge component of it, it is actually a company-wide audit that will include financial, HR, um, and other components. So if you are the IT manager and you are tasked with completing this audit and don't have support with the rest of your organization, you're going to have problems. So that's the number one thing that I see as a problem um, is that you have to understand this is not just an audit of the IT environment. So that, that's key to understand. There are um, different demands that we're seeing out there in the, in the marketplace when it comes to SOC 2 audits. I think that um, a lot of people think it's kind of a check the block activity, uh, but it's certainly not. You know, it's something that occurs over time, um, something that companies get into the rhythm of doing every year. Um, what would you tell people, you know, as far as, as far as what to expect when you're going into a SOC 2 audit? You know, what, what, what do you need to be thinking about doing, preparing um, when you're getting into this for the first time? Yeah, so the first thing, the, the, on your first audit, you need to expect it to take be a 12-month practice. And then depending on the, sta the state of your internal IT environment, you may need to dedicate a specific resource just to providing the evidence and updating the evidence because we as an auditor can't 
provide you evidence. We can't provide you controls and then audit them. Um, we are solely coming in to evaluate the controls, look at evidence the controls are in place. Um, so first of all, keep in mind, it's going to be 12 months. Now, what we do is kind of innovative in that we do a three-month uh, readiness assessment prior to beginning an audit. So we can condense the audit down to three or six months um, if need be. Um, a lot of it will also depend on what your client is asking for. They may want a 12-month SOC too. Um, so, so they can evaluate over 12 months what you've done. It's kind of like PCI. They want to see, you know, your quarterly updates, your monthly updates, that kind of stuff. Uh, make sure you've been doing it over the last year. Um, but there's no hard and fast on that. So um, there's a lot of prep that needs to be done. There's a lot of writing that will need to be done. There's a lot of evidence gathering on your side that needs to be done. Um, you need to have your pen tests and you need to have, you know, scanning and you need to have... Um, uh, you know, all your documentation in place and your HR employee handbook. And are you doing background checks or aren't you doing background checks? There's just a myriad of pieces of information that have little to nothing to do with IT. Too. So. Yeah, you know, and I think the other thing that, that's important to understand is that there are, uh, there are a variety of different types, right? Not all SOC 2 audits are, are the same. There's a type 1, which is essentially point-in-time assessment validating right. that the controls have been defined versus the type two, which holds a lot more weight, has a lot more credibility um, that validates that those controls exist over time. And one of the things I've seen is that a lot of companies are demanding, I think more than anything else, a SOC two type two uh, conducted over a 12 month period, right. right? Reviewing 12 months worth of controls. That's going to hold the most weight for an audit. Um, but it's not always the best place to start. You know, some companies might might want to start with a type one. Do you have any advice on when to choose a type two over a type one? I would say unless you have a specific driver from a client, start with a type one. A ready assessment and a type one, and then go to the type two from there. Because you can just build on the type one and to, to complete the type two. Um, but um you know, if you have to jump right into the type, type two, keep in mind, it may take 12 months to get it done. Uh, type one is still going to take three months or so based on the evidence collection. It's still, there's a ton of information that has to be provided. We still have to write the same kind of document and we still have to do the same kind of backend stuff for AICPA. So it's not like this is a, you know, we'll get it done on Thursday when you contract us on Wednesday. It's, it does, it's a time consuming audit. Um, it's not quick and it, will be at certain times painful, but if you know if you get your stuff squared away, this may be nothing. You may sell right through it. If I can add just like one thing that I see from kind of assisting you, Mike, on some of these SOC 2s is that I think one of the things that's daunting that, that companies tend not to get is that like the change management process has to be documented down. Mm -hmm. So if you if you make updates on a server like your patches, you better have the change management system that shows that you requested for change and that it got approved and it was like reviewed for impacts and, and that you can, you can show three or four of these because Mike may ask, okay, I want to see you know, a couple change management docs from July and I want to see some from September and I want to see some from February of this year. Right. And that'll give him kind of the, you know, the, the assurance that you're, you're continuing this process, right. That you're, you're, you're not only, you know, you didn't just write the doc, but you're actually conducting it in operational processes. And I think that's really hard to prove sometimes. Yeah, very much so. And it, because, you know, they're like, Oh yeah, well we did the change, but then it's like, how is it documented and help desk tickets are great for that or something of that nature. So yeah, you have to be able to provide the, the evidence over time, and that, that is critical. You're right, Law. What about determining scope for your, your audit, right? So some, some companies will have a variety of applications or, or a, um, different functions within the organization. And uh, on top of that, there's also uh, the five different trust service criteria right. that that you have to keep in mind? I mean, what, what's your guidance as far as um, determining scope, maybe even limiting scope uh, for your first audit or so? Well, I definitely recommend only doing one TSC the first time, and generally that's security. Um, if you add the additional TSCs, that's just additional 
data that will need to be provided and this additional time that will be needed and additional resources on your end that will be needed. Security, in my opinion, is really the primary one that we really want to, want to focus on. Um, and I think that is, is where you should be. Now with the SOC 2 Type 1, you can do it on an application that is architect to be SOC 2 compliant. Um, you don't have to do it as, you know, there's certain industry or, or enterprise wide things that need to be done, but it is not as stringent as a SOC 2 Type 2, which is the, really the company as a whole is functioning the way it's supposed to. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely recommend one TSC for your first time. If you want to expand from there, because the audit's going to get easier in the second year. So if you knock out security the first year, you want to add TSCs in the second year, uh, you know, like processing or, you know, one of those or privacy, um, add those in the second year because you've already knocked out security, which is really the, the bulk of the controls anyway. Um, so you're going to go ahead that, you know, bite the apple one, but take one bite at a time. Don't try and swallow the apple. That's really what it comes down to. So, yeah, again, why rush into things if, unless it's driven by a specific client requirement, uh, yeah. usually what we see is clients asking for the 12 month SOC two type two, but they're not necessarily they're not necessarily specifying which trust service criteria or TSC. Uh, they, they just want that audit done by a third party. And so it's really interesting because we get to sit on both sides of the fence. We have silent sector where we're building security programs and preparing for SOC 2 audits. And then on the other side, different companies, right? Because there, there has to be a separation there, but different companies will actually audit under our subsidiary Keystone audit. And so it's interesting to see both sides of the equation and and what that brings to mind for me is one of the questions people always ask is well okay we need we know we need to get prepared for this we know we need time to build a formalized cybersecurity program but what's the actual audit going to cost and so i wanted to touch on that really quick and let me know if you've seen any different out there but i would say most SOC 2 type 1 audits are generally going to be anywhere around 15 to to 20,000, maybe 25,000, depending on the size and sophistication of your organization. But I'm talking more mid-market and emerging company size, large enterprise, whole different ball game. Right. And then your SOC 2 type 2, probably yeah, yeah, usually between 25 and about 45. Is that is that what you're seeing out there? Yeah, I mean, again, it depends on the size of your organization. I've seen SOC 2 type 1 audits as low as you know 11 or 12 grand. And then I've also seen, you know, SOC 2 type 2 audits as high as 100,000. So it all depends on on what you're looking at, or 100,000 or more, I should say. Um, but yeah, 25 to 45 is a sweet spot for the SOC 2 type 2. And, you know, 15 to 25 is, is good for the SOC 2 type 1. Again, there's the occasional outlier where it's, it's lower, but... Um, Keep in mind that the, the driver isn't necessarily the size of your company. It's the amount of work that the auditor is required to do and the amount, you know, you have to generate all that evidence, but we still have a lot of work to do on our side as well by evaluating it all. Uh, there's stuff to do for the regulating body that needs to be completed um, and those sorts of things. So um, the audit isn't solely based on, you know, the size of your company. There's, there's still a lot of work that needs to be in that goes into this from our side. So um, there's no formulaic, you know, way of doing it. We're not sending it through a word processor where it's scanning everything. We actually, at least from the sound sector perspective, we actually read every word of your documentation. Um, when we actually verify that you are secure and that's our plan, our goal. And that's part of, you know, sound sectors mantra as well as, as Keystone pipeline, Keystone, not Keystone pipeline, uh, Keystone audit is that we, uh, we're still more concerned about your security and actual compliance rather than just checking boxes for you. So yeah, and definitely take a take a consultative approach uh, more yeah. than anything. And I think that's what what you want to look for in an auditor, right? Is somebody that's going to um, help provide guidance and such. Although they there there's a strict division of duties, there are things they can't do, right? Like you, you touched on, they can't design your controls for you. At least get somebody who's consultative and can provide guidance, um, things like that, rather than just giving just kicking out a report and saying there you go, right? I mean any. Yeah. Anybody can really do that. Uh, and there are a lot of auditors that only have an auditing background. But I think when you're out there looking for a auditor, you want to find somebody with deep, deep technical background 
and, 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 and uh, governance and strategic background as well, because they're going to almost function as a consultant through the process, um, again, with limitations, but uh, that'll be a lot more helpful to you. And then another thing that I've seen out there is that a lot of emerging size companies, you know, 30, 50, 80 employee type companies are, are um, going to some of the large auditors and they're treating them, the auditors are treating them as if they were Fortune 500 company. And right. there's certain things that just don't apply. You want to touch on that, like physical security controls and such that are just not, the expectations can't be the same for smaller enterprises? Well, yeah, very much so. I mean, you don't have as you don't have the layers of management. You don't have the uh, physical environments. You don't have, um, there's so much that we, you know, in a lot of these small companies, we just mark NA. I mean, we have the requirement there in, in, as far as um, TSEs are concerned, but it's just not needed. It's, it's not necessarily, and it's, it's a pain point that isn't required. Like if you don't, if you don't distribute mobile devices to your people, then there's no reason to have a mobile device policy. And you know, there's certain things like that, that, you know, you have to take in consideration. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is that there's a list of controls. And I think for security, it's something like 269 or 270 plus, something like that. Anyway, the auditor can choose anything out of there. Uh, to pull the records for, but they're not going to pull everything. So develop a good relationship with your auditor um, and and make sure they're fair and and do things that audit actually things that matter to you, um, that matter to the company and matter to your actual security. But I mean, in all honesty, Zach, you're correct. A lot of these auditors are not technical. I remember running into an auditor at a large company that I was at, and he was asking about how the software that we were installing was packaged, and I said have you ever installed a piece of software? And he flat out said, no. So those are the, some of the quality of people that you're going to run into that may be auditors. Um, so you have to keep that in mind that they are not technical people and they're not going to understand. So you have to be very verbose in your discussions uh, with them as far as and your documentation so that they understand that you know what you're doing. Um, I would also recommend that if you run into an auditor like that, maybe you find another auditor. So that's just... My, my own perspective. Well, what a, another recommendation for everybody going into the SOC 2 audit process for the first time is always, always start out with a readiness assessment. Yes. Uh, it can be done by your the auditor that you've chosen or, or some other party, but regardless, do a readiness assessment and then give yourself time. I mean, we, rec we recommend three months typically, but give yourself time to fill in those gaps. So when the audit comes, you're ready for that. Don't, don't jump into this. And that being said, the, the, worst com the worst situation companies get themselves in is they wait for their SOC 2 audits until a customer demands that they have one done in the next eight months, you know, or six months. And then it's just, it's almost too late at that point. So and you can, you can do a readiness assessment without having someone holding, a, you know, a, a sword over your head saying, you got to get this done now. Right or a contract that was good, just get it done. Yep. Start there. Start working toward building your your formalized cybersecurity program, and in, in accordance with SOC two. I wouldn't say SOC two is the best framework as a as a basis, but you can build it with NIST CSF or CIS controls or something like that if you haven't already, and then just crosswalk to the SOC two requirements and starting with the security trust service criteria you should be you should be good to go giving yourself some time and putting some resources into it so we are running out of time here speaking of time but um really think this is a excellent topic we'll probably cover this um regularly over future episodes because the SOC 2 requirements are are um uh, more and more frequent from large enterprises so excellent talk on this topic and we're just scratching the surface but before we jump off any final ideas thoughts you want to leave you know i think it's just worth contracting for contacting someone to do a readiness assessment if you're in that business that you described the b2b tech um just do a readiness assessment see where you are so you are prepared when that question comes up um, those are generally painless they're you know maybe a, you know take you generally we do them over a month um, and then we just go through the evidence and give you a, do you have this? Do you not have this? Maybe do a screen share and look over your shoulder and say, yeah, that document will suffice that won't. 
Um, and that'll really prepare you going forward. So when that question does come up and that million dollar contract's hanging over your head, pending SOC 2, you're like, all right, we can nail that out pretty quick. Yeah, and I'll just jump in and say that I think some of the things that we see missing the most is, I mean, obviously documentation is always missing. So just mm -hmm. because you're doing it doesn't mean that you've got it documented. Um, the other thing that I see missing is administrative control, you know, with the, with the um, you know, a diverse workforce like we have today, everybody's, you know, at the office, not at the office, controlling right. admin rights. If you're not controlling administrator rights today, you're, you're going to, you're going to have problems to start trying to get a handle on that. And then continuous vulnerability scanning and patching you know, for all your endpoints too, right? Whether they're remote or they're on-prem, doesn't matter. You need to be able to manage those endpoints from a, a update perspective making sure that your users can't use something legacy, right? Or install apps. And I mean, and here's one final thought for me, if you're using Google Chrome for any part of your business, you need to make sure you have a plan to keep that updated on a weekly basis. At this yeah. point. Oh, I'm just agreeing with you, man. That's, that's what's very true. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, update your Google Chrome, dang it. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> um, and, and get your pen test done. That's also critical. It's a requirement of SOC 2. It's a requirement of the PCI. It's recommended by NIST. It, 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 just do it. You know, get it done. Get And don't get the scan. Get an actual web app test and get an actual pen test. And you know what? Go the extra mile. Get the internal pen test too. Um, yep. Because, you know, we don't need the M&M &M structure, right? You need, you don't need, a, you know, the hard candy coating with a soft shell. You actually need to have, you know, a hard intern here as well. Excellent point. And we have a mini series of four podcasts all about pen testing. And we have a deep, deep discussion about, about that in our book, Cyber Rants, as well. So lots of good information out there. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for listening, for joining in. If you like the podcast, subscribe. Let us know your, your comments, your feedback, your ideas for topics, what you want us to discuss, and we will do so. Have a great rest of your day. See you next time. Pick up your copy of the Cyber Rants book on Amazon today. And if you're looking to take your cybersecurity program to the next level, visit us online at www.silentsector.com. Join us next time for another edition of the Cyber Rants podcast.